I'm Chair of the YDSC, and um, here with me is Amy Kennedy, Sarah Jones, and other people here at YDSC. Um, Carol's back there, Georgie. So I want to thank everybody who went over to the open house um, about five years ago when we wrote out our original goals for, for this organization. We said we want to have an office. And so we're so ha happy to be able to share it with community ag in historic Rock County and now Main Street. So we want to really thank you guys for coming and uh, christening the place. So, um, yeah, thanks for coming. A um, couple little housekeeping details. I want to thank Chris, as always, for taking good care of us. He is always there for us. The food and the fiddles and the service and um, his goodwill. And then um, also I want to thank our sponsors for Talking Green and the new power fund. Homelink and Sarah? Smoke out. Smoke out. And um, also, wanted to tell you guys about an event June 9th. It's Retreat Steamboat. And so it's the third event that we're having or hosting, I should say. Um, and the planting is going to be Powelson, Citizen Area, by Sanctuary, and a lot of the schools. Um, so that we have a lot of stewardship for the trees that we do plant so that we have healthy living trees. Um, versus just planting a lot of quantity. So this year is a little bit different. Um, we're going to partner up with uh, Main Street and do, do on Saturday. We're going to close down Fifth Street as well. Have vendors, um, music, fun, and Fritz will be uh, catering the barbecue. So um, it'll be a good time June 9th. And um, the other thing is that some of you guys might have gotten some of this in the mail. Is that actually we just launched partnerships. We're calling it partnerships because um, we believe anybody that helps us is furthering um, a healthier environment for future generations. So um, if you get this in the mail, just know you're doing some good because we are, um, we're growing by leaps and bounds and looking for some more permanent funding. So if you see this or if you want to grab one on your way out and help us, that'd be awesome. And <coughs> thank you for the speakers. I'm going to let Paul introduce everybody. and. Uh, Paul Podian, board member here too, and he's going to introduce you to our speakers tonight. Thanks, guys. Yay! Thank you all very much for coming. Can I stand in the right place? I have. Back up. Back up. There. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We need a we need a director here. Um, I'm Paul Podian. I'm on the board of YPSC, and. Um, for those of you who just want to get off the street, this, the topic of tonight's Talking Green is traditional resilience and self-sufficiency in pre-Ski Corp Route County. And um, we have some really um, uh, valuable assets here to talk about this. Um, Elaine Gay, who has turned 94. Uh, Joe Stanko, who has lived here for almost, almost ever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, if you know about the Stanko Ranch, you, at least you probably, at the very least, you know about the uh, sheepdog trials that they host in the summertime. But there's a lot more of that story. And she'll tell you about that. And Paul Bonifield, who I, I, would, I would suggest is the uh, unofficial historian of South Route. So I'm really happy to have all three of you guys here. Um, what we'd like to do is have each of them talk for about 10 minutes and try to hold your questions. There'll be a question and answer period in general for everyone after we're through the 10 minute presentations. So what I'd like to do is uh, ask Jo to uh, present her part of this. Okay. Thanks, jo. Yeah. Thank you. I, I look around and I see people that have lived it longer than I have and uh, been born through. But as you can see from here, this is a Joeism. And in the two winters ago, this is how I felt. I don't know about the rest of you. And actually, these aren't old photographs. These were taken two winters ago, right out the door. But I, I firmly believe that our place and location is what made us become sustainable. Who's the next one? Yeah, and um, I think that you know even the animals, even in the in the old days, the animals left. Okay, and so this is my thought 
thoughts on it. I'm no great philosopher, but I felt that the harsh climate and, and the difficulty of getting out and force people, both urban and rural, in their, those times to become self-reliant, while they also developed a strong sense of community. And except for the herds of cattle and flocks of sheep, which were brought into graze, the majority of agriculture in this area was actually subsistence. And when Jim's grandparents settled in, here in, the, in 1907, at that point in time, when they started the ranch, the, the numbers were that it took 19 farmers to feed 20 people, and 19 of those people were the farmers. And that actually is the way that it was. You, you grew everything you needed and what you had extra if you took into town to sell for cash or to trade for something that you couldn't grow. So everyday life was a matter of conservation and subsistence and sustainability. And the, it was repair, redo, reuse, make, use, make, do, and don't throw anything away. I don't know what you guys think all those sheds out of the Stanko Ranch are, but I'll tell you what they are. They're full of don't throw anything away. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and we have used things and drug things out, and you've got piles of metal, and you've got piles of fence posts, and you've got piles of bricks, and you've got something that somebody else was throwing away, you'd bring, and actually you did use a lot of those things. If you were harrowing, you took a piece of iron and you tied it on the harrow if you needed to get it deeper, and you used that as weight. You used it as counterbalance. Who knows what you would make out of it? Worst kind of worse, you can make a bonfire. So, so some of the things in everyday life were um, I'll examples of being conservative or, or sustainable. This is a picture of, we had two of these. I grew up with one. I grew up on the front range in Aurora, and then in the summers we lived in Grand Lake. And the Stankos had one when I moved onto the ranch in, in, in 1966. That's a Maytag washer. It's a ringer washer. Wow. Ours was not, we didn't have a hose that we filled it up. We used a big water tub. We heated the water tubs and then dumped, dumped the hot water in there and mixed with the cold water. It wasn't electric, it was gas, because we didn't have electricity when they first got it. So it was a, a, a kerosene running um, Maytag. And then what you did is you that agitated it. And you put the soap in there, and then you would bring it into the first rinse, bring it through to the second rinse. Part of the thing is what you do when you sort clothes, had nothing to do with the, the not bleeding. It had to do with you started with the wipes because they were normally cleaner. <laughs> and you finished up with the jeans because they were dirtier. And what you did when this got too dirty is you took the first rinse, dumped it in there, added some more hot, hot, hot uh, water from the wood stove, moved that over, and then you filled the third rinse water to go through it. When you were finished with the water, you called somebody, and it usually took two people, and you called somebody and you took those tubs of water out and you dumped them on if you were planting trees or in the garden or on the yard. And the soap was great because it helped break down the molecules of the water to make it more effective. The second thing is we'll talk a little bit about clothing. And everybody's heard about feed sack clothing. I grew up, when I was 13, I was so thrilled with my very first store-bought dress. And I have to tell you, when I think back on it, it was probably the most hideous thing I could have picked. But it had, it, to me, it was beautiful. It was purple and pink because I grew up with my mom making all of her clothes, and I actually grew up with the feed sacks. And they started, and the feed sacks were available from about 1900 to 1960. Uh, um, they had, oh, more than that, 1800 to, to 1960. They found out it was a great marketing thing. They found that it was useful, and I read one account where a teacher had been writing and saying, these kids are all in their feet set dresses, and you'll notice that they're in the same clothes. I had one account where a teacher said you knew which family the kids were from because they were wearing the same pattern. They had a wide range of patterns that they used to make them. And I had read another account where a father said that when he went to the, to, to the feed store, Whichever kid it was due to get a new piece of clothing, that was the kid that got to go with him to the feed store because that way she could pick out her own pattern for her clothes. Wow. <laughs> so all of my friends grew up with feed 
uh, even on the front range in, in, in Aurora until about 1950 or 60. Um, grew up with beet sack clumps and we because we still had chickens and it was the same up here. The other thing is that this went out when they developed after World War II and, and they, the paper was cheaper. And then on top of that, they experimented to try to keep it going, and I, I found out they tried with the, in the late early 60s with the nylons and the rayons, but they weren't as effective. So, so that was the feast that clothes. You also had a whole culture around your clothes. You never threw clothes and clothing out. First of all, you'd see if somebody else in the family would, could wear it. If they couldn't, you cut out the straight pieces and you remade it to fit someone who was further. And I don't know about you, Elaine has it, and I have very familiar. The, yeah, the buttons, the buttons, you didn't throw it if you were taking it off. You cut the buttons. I have a pile, my grandmother's button box, and <laughs> Natalie's button box, and I have all of these buttons. And you cut off the buttons, you cut off the bubbles, and you save them so that you had those to reuse when you were going to sew. Natalie was more, um, well, my grandmother was more organized than anybody I ever saw with her button box because she took little pieces of wire and kept the same kinds of buttons together so that she was conserving in time so she didn't have to sew through and pick out that two buttons so that were the same right or the same shape. Wow. So, so after you finished with that, and it, after it got to the point where you couldn't use it for patching material, then it became rags. So you use those clothes. You put up for the for the winter. Here, you know, you've got a 59 day growing season. So Natalie and I used to take, and I'm sure that some of these other ladies, every fall, late summer, we take a trip down with our neighbors. We take a truck and we go down to Grand Junction. And we would come back with peaches and tomatoes and cucumbers and cantaloupe and watermelon and all of those things. And we would spend two weeks canning. The jars were reusable. And every year you, you didn't throw the jars out because even after they got nips on them, you couldn't use them for canning. But at, at our house, we have right now, where you used them and made them into storage containers where you put the lid on a board and nailed it down, and then you screwed yeah. the jar in so they were hanging down storage containers. You can always find a use for a jar. Um, the next one, because I only have 10 minutes, so I've got to talk better. Okay, so nothing was thrown away, and even in Route County, not even the buildings. Um, CU came up and did some surveys around some of the old ranches, and it was traditional and common here in Route County that not all of the buildings on all those ranches were built from scratch. They came from other places. I am proud to say this is our machine shed, and we probably have the only machine shed in Route County that has a, that has a stage on it, because that machine shed actually was the dance hall from Pedro. Um, <laughs> Wow. And you can imagine how they were bringing it here. It had a front door and it had a little front part. My father-in-law, when he brought it up, he cut that in so you could get the tractors in. And the little front part, which was also metal, is now what we call the tank shed, where you held, you keep, where we keep <coughs> all of the gallons of uh, oil that we change, or the gas tanks that we have to haul down when we're down uh, filling the tractors from from up here, and we don't want to drive them back up so we can haul them down. This is my friend Kay Wagner's house. There are houses in Milner, Craig, and Steamboat that actually came from uh, Bear, Bear River, from, uh, what was it, Mount Harris? And Victor America, I think it was. And, and those were all brought in. What my friend did is her house is even smaller than mine. The footprint of my house is, is uh, 30 by 30 on the outside. The footprint of her house is smaller than that, and you can see that it was two two floors. Well, it was only one floor. She moved out one year, spent $25,000, had them take the roof off and put a second floor on it just a few years ago. So the house, when you're going to Craig, Diane Holly's house, it actually was a, a rock house in Milner. And she has photographs, I tried to get some photographs of bringing that house from Milner up the hill, being drawn by horses, and set out there. So, so even the buildings, and it's common, and when you look at a lot of the ra uh, houses, ranches around, we have two Mount Harris garages. We have the coal house 
from Dr. Willett's house that was down here on 4th Street, no. We have a, um, a Bear Valley um, coal house. So all of those little sheds around there were brought in, not necessarily new. Our barn was new, <coughs> built from scratch. In fact, my husband's grandfather cost $1,200 to build that barn and it is 102 years old this year. So they did a good night. So even the buildings were reused. We, they, you, you relied on your neighbors because you're very light dependent on them in these harsh climates. You couldn't hop in the car and drive down to Denver the way we do now. You had to take the, the stage and it came up through Walcott, and I don't like that trip myself today, you know, much less on a stage. So, so you relied on your neighbors. And we saved resources by sharing and working together. The way we worked with our neighbors is when we put up hay, what we did is we provided two pieces of equipment. They provided two pieces of equipment. We provided the people to run the two pieces of equipment. They provided the people to run the two pieces of equipment. And the stacking crew, we did. Um, so you shared the resources. Nobody ever had to buy the, all of their own equipment. In the schoolhouse, we provided a half acre for our house out there. They provided a half acre. We built the schools. And when it went uh, consolidated, then it reverted back. And the hot lunch program, there was a set of dip pots and pans, and you cooked for one week for each number of children that you had, and you brought the hot lunch in to school. We had a sense of community. The Moffat Tongue was something that everybody co contributed to. In fact, they trained politically at the time in the 20s. It was vital to us to get to the trains. It was providing our market. It was transportation to Denver. And so we performed uh, nine counties parts of nine counties did a special district in order to pay for the Moffat Tunnel. And Jim and I were one of the few people every year that voted until 1996 when it was gone to ask for our Moffat Tunnel ballot so we could vote for the people on, that were uh, in charge of that. Yampa Valley Electric in the 1940s, they, it was started. Actually, the driving force was the extension uh, office at that time. They had a 10-member board who were, in the 1940s, were set out to get members, and it was $5 to become a member. And if people didn't have it, then the, then the 10 board members actually gave up their own funds for that. The power came on on my house. I had one of the first houses. The power was turned on on our house on uh, December 1st, 1941. Then a lot of people didn't get power because they didn't, didn't jump on it fast enough. We got it first because uh, my husband's grandfather was a board member and people weren't too sure how this electricity was going to work, but people had to wait for a while because December 7, 1941 occurred, and the war effort, we lost a bit. The war effort here, um, I just want to read to you a little bit of something. In the war effort, yeah, Route County in 1944 had more than any other county above and beyond what they were asked to produce, and this is how the sense of community went. It started out with uh, first Taconis, which had a population of 200 people, raised $4,400 at $22 a person. They, the uh, one man sent an entire load of uh, lettuce and onions and potatoes that they sold on the front range for it. The cattlemen got together all across the county and they sent a load of cattle that were sold there. Uh, everybody gave what they could. There was even out of Hayden came a carload of wheat and uh, a carload of potatoes out of Hayden. Everybody gave what they could, and it didn't necessarily have to be money. So we had a sense of, of community. I'll skip Route Memorial Hospital. It's uh, one of the ranches up Elk River sold one of the ranchers sold a ranch up Elk River to contribute, not for this new one, but the one up at the end of 7th Street. Um, Jim's relative sold his hospitals, and those proceeds all went to it. Okay? And I think, so even now, we use still, you pe the people that have lived it, we still reuse, repurpose, and repair are still in effect today, and in our house, if it doesn't move, and it's old, it's Christmas lights on it. <laughs> Everything's become Christmas 
decoration. <laughs> What I'd like to do is to uh, just have a discussion with Elaine. I've uh, sat down and talked to her at her house uh, last month, and uh, she had some really interesting things to say, so I thought I would uh, not, uh, not make you stand up. We could just sit here together. This is the easy way to do it, right. For me. <laughs> well, it's not so bad for me either. So, Elaine, first, why don't you just give us a little bit of background. I know a lot of people know about you, and uh, but I think there are people here who don't know uh, about your experience growing up in Pleasant Valley. So can you tell us? Okay. I grew up in Valley, but married a man who lived in Pleasant Valley. Okay. Okay. Can everybody hear Elaine? Grandma, can you speak this way and a little louder? Okay. Talk to Todd back there. Yeah, talk to Todd. Talk to Todd. Talk to Todd. So, um, when was that that you moved to Pleasant Valley? After I married Bob in 1938. 1938. Um, and you guys were. Uh, We'd gone together for quite a few years. Uh -huh. And then I went to college. And he, did want, he wanted to get married, and I didn't. I wanted to go to college. So I went to college, and, it, and I didn't finish college. I got a certificate for two years. You could go for two, two years and get a certificate to teach for two years, and you had to go back and get more education before you could go on mm -hmm. that time. Okay. And it to that. All right. Yeah. So you've lived in a couple of different places in Pleasant Valley. At what point did you move to your current? Uh, in. Uh, a little bit about what your husband did and what you did. Well, we didn't have road in there. We had mud roads. So we fought the mud for a good number of years for it was gravel road and a county road. And the ha reason it was a county road, uh, they, uh, the, uh, they were making our school consolidate with sea road and pay. And then we would have been left to get our children cleared out of the Brenner Bridge, which was about five miles. We would have had to take a bus from there on. But they wanted our money from our school so badly that <laughs> we talked them into furnishing a bus that would come through to our door and get our children. And the snowplow then had the county road. We had to make it a county road so the snowplows could come in and clean it out so we could get in and out because we had a lot of snow. So how did you, uh, uh, well there's a couple of things here. The first thing is, um, you didn't get into town very much, right? No. Because of the roads. But I canned a lot, we butchered a lot, we had a few elk and deer that we had to eat in the meantime. And uh, I had chickens always, and uh, I, made, I made my cheese, the yellow cheese that you could buy, I made. Yeah. and put in the <coughs> oh, cheesecloth and press the milk all out of them and then I hung them up so those flies and stuff couldn't get to them in the basement and they had this cheesecloth around and you had to cure them oh, for quite a few days to make a cheese and the kids would be and the family when are we going to get to that cheese? When are we going to eat the cheese? They kept after me. So I'd take it down usually before it was ready to come down, but we ate the cheese and stuff that I made. And I made cottage cheese, of course, too. I canned all our fruit and we cured our pork that we had for us, raised pigs, and had ham that we cured, and I canned the beef that we had or, and the elk meat. 
so that we always had heat in the summer because we could run the town all. I understand that um, you did grow some of your own yes. vegetables, but you I also, there was started. somebody who came up from Grand Junction every once in a while who would. Yes, the fruit. Yes. fruit. I grew a great big garden <coughs> myself and canned some of that. Yeah. And there was a fruit peddler that always came on a Friday, and he always came in with fruit tomatoes and peaches and apricots and whatever was. He was raising at that time, and it would always come to my house and I'd buy something. You told me a story about uh, Paul Monfield. Yes. You let her get a good story. About the sweet break. About about him when he was young. That you had him help you with um, uh, hay. Remember. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, sweet break yes, that's okay. right. <laughs> we had sweet breaks, and uh, I had run the sweet break into a bank. You had to be kind of careful when you, you with the teeth on it. Or they're made out of wood, right? Yes, they were. And they were pointed, and when the government's ground, it would break them off. And I had broken a couple off. I got them in the wrong place. And Paul had spent all morning fixing the sweet break. And uh, we had a bridge with boards on top of the bridge that run back and forth, about three or four, wide enough for the tracks of the car and the wagons. So. And uh, Paul spent all morning fixing the two teeth on the sweet rake, or three teeth. And Bob warned me when I brought the sweet rake out to the hay field to watch out for those boards on the plank, uh, on the bridge. They had put boards that, that you made went on your car with, and uh, over the bridge itself. And uh, Bob warned me to put the pull the teeth up before I ever started across there on those boards. Well, I got there. Got did do it, but it was too late. They got caught under that roller, and it almost threw me in the river. And it swung out, and the teeth on the the sweep break went and it just all fell off. It just turned around and broke them all <laughs> off. Well, I sure he didn't go to the field where Paul was. He spent all the morning fixing the <laughs> tube. You had to run down there and put this hose on to turn the lights on. And then, it, if you had went down there in the dark, by then you were out of lights. But about halfway to back to the house, the lights were gone. <laughs> so it was really quite a thing, and it was direct current, so you couldn't have use your refrigerator or, or irons or anything like that on. But, Just for lighting. But it was they had everything lit up, and so. You turned the bathroom lights on downstairs in the kitchen, and it also turned on great big yard lights on the outside of the house, on each end of the house. So all the neighbors knew when you went to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so you turned on that light, and these big 
the Mormon crickets that came in and wiped out everything. This was a hard, hard time. They that made it so much that we have to learn from is how they adjusted. If you look now, I don't care where you live here in the steamboat area or anywhere in the county, if you take a look, you can find where once upon a time somebody tried to plow something or do something that did not work. And you can see how nature came back to over and recover. There's one thing to be learned. You can violate it so long and then Mother Nature will tell you where you can go and she will put you <laughs> She will do it very abruptly. All right. After 1920, you will find that those people that remained adjusted, one of the things they did, all this valley throughout it had a tremendous number of uh, purebred Hereford breeders because that was the catalyst that was being bred. And they were by breeding and improving their cattle. Then came in the 1960s knowledge of genetics. But by improving cattle herds, more pounds, less animals. When I was a kid in the 1950s, a kid that is a teenager and in my 20s, <clears throat> when we shipped, you had a 350 pound uh, calves as an average. You did a very good job. Today, if you don't have at least a 500 pound animal at the same age, you don't have much. See, they go 500, 550, 600 pounds. It's because of genetics and how we breed them. It's learning what you're doing. If you go on to the Forest Service or public lands now, you will find there are more animals out there grazing producing, that is deer, elk, and 1900, there was predictions that there would be no wildlife, that is deer, elk, antelope, buck, and so on, south of the 49th parallel. They were putting elk here in steamboats so it would be a place where people could come to see. There was talk of having a national park or a state park for elk by Hayden on 1200 acres. The woman was picking up all of the crippled deer and saving them around Craig. That's why there's a deer herd there. The antelope were extinct until the blizzard of 1949 drove them out of Wyoming into Colorado. But yet we have managed to improve it a great deal. So when you start talking about sustainability, remember you came a long ways. It's kind of discouraging when you can look ahead. You can say, God, and what have you. And when you look behind, it's got a hell of a lot better. They have done that across the board. <clears throat> when you talk about, what can I do, you see, as an individual or as a person, the second oldest forest reserve in the United States is the White River National Forest that until recently came down to Yampa and included the Flat Top Mountains. They were wanting to develop that area. There has been no really great stands of spruce timber was in there, and the people that lived down the White River from Trappers Lake wanted to preserve it. They happened to contact the right man in Colorado Springs who happened to contact and our senator and our governor were opposed to it, the right people in Washington, wound up having the second oldest national forest reserve. Now that was only a small handful of settlers who was able to accomplish it. So don't ever underestimate your own power of what you can do. Now, one of the things that has made it besides being able to be progressing, that is to think in terms of how you breed, what you do, how you rotate your pastures, and so on, is as you were talking about, it's the reusing of things. That's sweet break. I don't know whether you know what it was, what they are, but we used to get behind, you see, blew his head and shove it up. That was sweeping the field. 
and you push it into the stacker and it put it up on the stack. And you stacked it by hand. But you made everything that is around. The things you could do. What I want you to do is take about five to ten seconds and look in this room with what is sustainable. See, what can you do that's obvious? That rock wall came from rocks right here in this area. See, that wasn't shipped in, and somebody, and I have no idea who, just went out with a wagon and hauled them in. That concrete that was originally that has been worked on since then was mixed by hand. See, somebody had resourcefulness, somebody had the energy, and somebody had the willpower to build it. Beautiful wall that has lasted, I don't know how long, but probably a hundred years or more. You just, you see a pile of rocks. I can do something with that. And you were talking about, you see all those things that we were doing? Just go to the sales. <laughs> see, and uh, see all these little things you get with all the junk. But Johnny Pierce used to love getting that because then he could create a multitude. If you take a look at that wall, those boards, those are native boards that were cut here, they're rough cut. The, with all of the pine, uh, tim the timber being killed, the lodge pole, the beetle killed. In 1939, the spruce beetles hit the flat tops and destroyed over a million acres of 300 year old. Engelman spruce. In the 50s, early 1940s, early 50s, you looked up at the flat tops, the little flat tops, and what have you, and it was nothing but brown. There was no green there. That was a logging area in South Route. All kinds of little small sawmills were all over. They all had to move out, except Art Milo, the phone, Eddie Apple. And he started sawing those boards. If you will go through Steamboat Springs or any other town in this valley and a lot of other places, you will find houses that are built with those same timber. A lot of them just have the, on the outside log and they're six by sixes with one quarter of them around. And you look and you see all of the beetle killed under with the bark. Uh, the, the bark just came off. Also, if you look at that beam back there, see what they would do is they take the beetle kill that's right above your head. If you take the beetle kill stuff, you have to have the full tail. It has to be thicker because it's not as strong. But you can lay one on the other, or you can cut them thicker. At, so at Craig, at MJK Sales, there used to be, they have now tore it down. Well, it was known as a tin elevator, a grain elevator. It was tin because the outside of it was tin. But inside that was nothing but two fours laid one on top of the other, on top of the other. Strong, and one was there, the next to the other. You had to keep it plumb as you went up. You could overlay it. You could take a four, a two by four. If it was four feet long, it fit in. If it was eight foot long, it fit in. If it was six feet long, you see, the length did not make any difference because you were laying it flat. And when you came to the corner, you squared it. You overlapped it. You could go any way you want with them. You could build walls that way. There are walls and houses that were simply built by stacking lumber one on top of the other. Wow. We have all of this field kill. We have the resource. The way you have to get it, though, is you're going to have to put own physical labor into it. It is not economically feasible to log it in large bunches and market it across a large area. If you know somebody that has 40 acres of beetle kill timber, tell them to start sawing it down and sawing it up. You can sell it. You can take the slabs. Some beautiful houses made out of just the side of the slab, put it up, put one against the other, fences, 
There's a multitude of uses for slabs. There's a man right now up on King Mountain, he simply, with a lot of it, uses chips on it, you see, and just breaks it all up into chip stuff. And then he covers roads in order to have it so we don't have dust, and it rots back into the soil. And it makes no difference, and when it goes away, he puts some more on it. It's not a paved highway, mind you, but it will serve the purpose. You put it around your garden, keep the weeds from coming. Think about what you have. Think about what the hell can I do with that chunk that chunk? <laughs> Helen's got a whole bunch of it. <laughs> There's artwork made out of this. We're talking about the, the saving the buttons. Oh yeah, I saved a shirt away the other day, and I kind of found the buttons laying there. Somebody <laughs> comes back and fits them. It's cute. We didn't have uh, a lot of money when we were small. The fresh was on in the, in the war scare season and so on. So it became a thing every Christmas. The gift you gave, you had to make. Mm -hmm. You had to mm -hmm. make something because it represented you. Think about what you could do in terms of just being creative. Don't throw it away. Another thing, the last thing I want to bring out, is the difference in how we handle places and different people. When we drove up today to get a lane, I was really taken by how much grass there is now, all that's growing there. The reason they have that is because <coughs> the year-to-year, -year, year grazing practices they use is based on what will come back. They never truly abuse it. You see, if you leave something, then come back. You don't take it all. You let it come up. There's a rancher down in Dupont, or at uh, Yampa who has it grazed off and he's in trouble. I will guarantee you when this year is over Gaze will still be in business and that other man's going to be in trouble. There's other ranchers. Now Wayne Shoemaker, you can get natural needs from him he is very conscious of how he handles his range. The whole study of range began as good as a science during and right after World War II, and it's far from perfect. But God has his stuff down there, and you can go down to the courthouse and find out a lot of power. In all life, as there is a statement, begins with grass what they eat or what it grows. That I'll quit and let somebody else know. Thank you. Um, I don't even know what time it was. I don't know what I did with my watch, but do we have time? Yeah, we'll have time yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, uh, we could either do a sort of a formal raise your hand and ask a question and I can try and do that, or we could just break it up and have an informal thing. I don't particularly have a uh, a preference. Maybe Paul, do a couple questions, and then we can. Okay. Todd, uh, I have a question <coughs> as the ag agent, and I, I know <laughs> all of you can answer this. So I'd like you put you put your collective minds together. What crops have been grown in the Yampa Valley through the years that uh, maybe didn't? Maybe we're still not doing it, but we're growing on a commercial scale just to give people Strawberry. an idea of things that were growing at one time. Strawberries. Strawberries. Lettuce. Spinach. Potatoes. 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 Potato
when the places were small and people had to make it work, if they had a flat spot, they raised something there. Now, tomatoes, I don't think we ever, was, those were raised. Well, they raised those. And corn, I don't think, but but there's been uh, around Craig, the maize and so on, flour was made, the wheat and it was uh, elevators, grain, there are uh, flour elevators in Steamboat, in Hayden, two in Craig, one in bags, and you made your breakfast cereal. Where, where I live in Whitewood, I understand it. Uh, until the 70s, I think they sold the, I think it was one big farm, and it was a potato farm. And they would just, uh, at the end of the season, they just take them down in wagons or trucks or something and load them onto the train right there at Sydney. Mm -hmm. So that, at least there, I know, was pretty, uh, a pretty successful crop. Well, where the football field is in Oak Creek, that was a potato field above that, and there was a potato cellar right there. My dad raised cabbages, and I mean a lot of cabbages. So the first day I had with Bob, he called me up and asked me if I would go to the movie with him. And I said, well, yes. He said, what time should I come down? I said, don't come down till after we water the cabbages. <laughs> and he said, how many cabbages do you have? I said, I think a thousand. My dad ordered a thousand plants, and that which he did. And we planted those cabbages, and you, to get them started, you had to water them every night from the creek, and you take a can of water and water each plant. And so it took the whole family, but you didn't do it until they got started. After they got started, you didn't do it anymore. But you, to get them started, you watered them at night. And he laughed and laughed, he said, when I told him how many we had. He thought that was the funniest thing. And I told him he wouldn't think it was funny if he had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim said we made cabbages, they were they were Slavic. And they we still have all of the things because they we've got the great big crops because when you raise it, you've got to be able to store it. You know, it's like your carrots are stored and now we use cat litter which you lay them so they don't touch each other and put layers on and yeah. they'll last through the winter and the potatoes have to hang up and be be dried and the cabbage has to be made into coleslaw and, and, and it could be buried in sand. Right. Yeah, I mean, the uh, cabbage. Sorry, crap. And put sand in them and covered the carrots and cabbages and sold to the Safeway store. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? Look, they just put it to store and as long as you're on that. Eggs, they used to take the eggs and stick them down in the grain. And so they would keep them in the wintertime where they wouldn't freeze and there wouldn't be any air to them. And they could keep them much longer and keep the leg when you put it in. Wow. And, and we used to ship cream, mm -hmm. milk, and cattle out of here. In 1933, out of Steamboat Springs, there were more cattle. Our, our market was in Chicago. And because it was a regional, you know, of Tampa, the whole, whole, even bags, we shipped more cattle to Chicago in 1933 than any other place in the nation. Really? Yeah. And, and cream cans were, you set the cream, we still have all our cans with the names on it, you set the cream, the extra cream that you didn't use and you couldn't sell in town, you accumulate it, bring it down here to the depot, set it on there, they put it in the truck, uh, train, take it to Denver to the dairies, and you're, you'd go down and pick up your used can and put your new can down. Give me one more with that with your cream. They had what was called a cow sow pen operation. You milk the cow, got your cream and what you had to have, your skim milk, they fed to pigs, or you fed to your hens, your chickens as part of their feed. So that cow, she raised you a calf, she gave you some cash, she raised your pig, and she raised your chickens. Yes. Yeah. We're going to ask a question. Yeah, well, I was going to make a comment actually about. Um, out in the interior design world, and you know, I'm sitting here looking at the curtains in this room, and you brought up how sustainable this this room was, and they're made out of the burlap that is used in the pizza, and and I have used that a lot of window treatments in my life, but right now there is a phenomenon going on. Like I have a wallpaper book. I wish I'd brought it here because for 
$120 a yard, you can get burlap that is printed like the <laughs> <laughs> and, and there are so many things right now. It's wow. like the world is yearning for what you guys have. Yeah. And they're willing to pay a lot of money for it. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I wish I brought this book. You would die. Thank you. Dale, did you want to ask a question? Lane, you said you, you cured uh, pork. Yes. Things. Did, did you smoke cure or salt cure? We had salt. Martin salt. And we do it in a cave. Or, yeah. Uh, what do you call it? A barrel. And you would salt. You had a sugar. Or it was a stuff you bumped. The salt and sugar that would cure the hand. You would sprinkle that on and sort these barrels that and it would cure it and keep, you could keep it that way with this work. How long would it keep it? Oh, all winter or all summer. Winter, you usually did it in the fall and give it all winter, you know, and you could either eat it out of the barrel and take it out and thaw it out. Did you have a spring house? Yes, we did. Oh, what? A, explain to what a spring house well, is. This so one was a, this was built down kind of in the ground, and it uh, was two buildings though. The first one was a cement building, and then there was a large building with space, but quite a big space around the walls, and it was on the outside. And so then you put your eggs and stuff down there, and they wouldn't freeze, having the double walls like that. And it was down in the ground. And, and my my mother was raised in Oklahoma, not here, but a spring house in there was, you built it out of stone, two layers, and the spring ran through it. And so it was your refrigerator. It kept it from freezing, but it also kept it in hot like it kept in school. And that's where they cured their cottage cheese. My mother won't eat cottage cheese because they made their own house. Yeah, I made a lot of cottage cheese, but I made the other kind of cheese too. Well, it's harder and took a lot more time. And one of the things I was going to say that was interesting about ranching, and we have so many people that had their, their meat as time got on, I was amazed when I married into a cattle ranching family that they never ate meat because you didn't eat your cash crop. You <laughs> ran <laughs> oh, <sh> Why did you borrow? <laughs> you spontaneously <laughs> took something. <laughs> Something and then in the winter they could scrape the 
mold off, go down to the meat, and have very quick meat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have the, the directions for in Iowa. My mother in law came from Iowa. She said she was never a local because she only came here in 1952. But, <laughs> but she she used to talk about, and then she gave me the directions in her grandmother's handwritten book, how they would cut the meat and they would put it in the cool house, but they would wrap it in paper, and then they would make a slurry of flour and water, and they would wrap that paper in that, so it was like a crust, and it would get hard, and it would keep the bugs from getting into it, and also keep it where they keep it that was So it was like... Right. The cabbage was turned into sauerkraut too in the winter time. Put yeah. behind this kitchen stove to ferment or whatever it did. So that's the okay. You didn't have to use everybody made their sauerkraut. Paul well, mentioned the the uh, problems in the 1920s. What about the Great Depression? How, how was it? I mean, you mentioned that in certain speed they were shipping out all this cattle from here. And at some point, were they also shipping out all the deer and elk, too? No, no. Not from here? No, so they'd stop that. They'd stop that, but they had been doing that. Before yes, that. at the turn of the century, they had. They had. That's when they decimated the The forest and wildlife, now, almost all of them lived on what they called Buckskin and Water Street. So there was a lot of poaching going on. But as far as your deer and elk herds, they were increasing in numbers, and they continued to do so. There was no game that was just slaughtered and then left and shot. And so there was a certain amount of conservation that went along with it, and there was a certain amount of law enforcement that went along with it. And then uh, during the Depression, though, one of the things that was a common thought among all the people I've talked to and so on at that time was at least you could raise your own food and you could produce your own so you were better off than you were somewhere else. Now, it was not common, but it was not uncommon either. For uh, some of the ranchers that worked also part of the time in the coal mines, but they would bring in potatoes and milk then they would cook uh, the potatoes and milk for a potato soup to give to miners that didn't have anything. So then you made your own uh, soap. There's an old pair of skis even. It's up on the old Nelson place up there. And uh, they have edges on their skis so they could turn. Well, they took the sickle bar off, which is a little narrow stretch of metal that they used along the mowing machine sickle and put the in there so they cut. Well they riveted that on the side of their skis and now they've had edges so they could <laughs> be with it. I, if I could ever get up there and steal it I'd bring it down and get it in the museum. Because <laughs> they really are a creation. But during the thirties and it was hard times, but also in the early part of the thirties that it is very part of the Depression in the 1920s, early 30s. The county gave out 22 uh, rounds to people to go kill uh, jackrabbits. And there were a lot of jackrabbits. There were jackrabbit drives, which they would all circle a section of ground and run all the jackrabbits <laughs> into the center and then kill them, you see, and then ship them off to poor people and so on. Well, this seems like a good time to. Uh, it seems like it's interesting. We're, we think that sustainability is a new phase. It's not. It's. I mean, the real sustainability is you use it up and you use it over, and you know, you, I mean, you just. It's the way to live. It's not a trend. It's just the way to live and be cognizant of the earth. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I'd like to invite you to stay and ask questions and talk to your uh, talk to your friends, talk to our participants, and uh, thank you very much, all three of you.